Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Welcome back to Dark Poutine. I am Mike Brown. Across the table from me is my good friend, Matthew Stockton. Hello, Matthew. I would like to do a shout out to people who listen to us while they commute. Okay. Uh, because we're recording midweek for a change. Yep. And um, it took me three times longer to get here than it does on a Sunday. And I was like, people do this every, because I left during rush hour. Yeah. I'm like, oh, poor people who do it every day. So I'm like, shout out to commuters. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah, thanks for letting us entertain you while you're uh, while you're driving or sitting in sitting, a car on the highway. <laughs> yeah, sitting in a car on the bus, whatever you're doing. Thank you. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor its parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Our content is often intense and some listeners may find it disturbing. We are not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We are ordinary Canadian schmucks chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some dark poutine. You are responsible for obtaining and maintaining at your own cost all equipment needed to listen to dark poutine. Dark poutine can be addictive. Side effects may include, but not be limited to, pausing and questioning the system, elevated heart rate, pondering humanity, odd looks from colleagues as you laugh out loud at work, family members not into true crime worrying about you. Positive side effects may include some perspectives and opinions that you disagree with, as well as some wokeness and empathy. If you don't think dark poutine is for you, consult your doctor immediately. Before this episode gets underway, we have some important housekeeping business to address. As I was rewriting and editing this episode, I had a realization that the term away game, referring to the cases outside of Canada, is kind of insensitive and it might be offensive to somebody. We realize these stories are in no way a game. And moving forward, we'll be referring to cases taking place in regions other than Canada simply as away. And I personally want to apologize to anybody who's felt hurt by that insensitivity. We try to live by the wise words of Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. Anyway, anyone who's read my first book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, will recognize this story as its first chapter. Now, ever since writing the book, I've wanted to tell this story on the podcast, as there are some details not in the book, as well as audio-only elements, which were then transcribed for the book, but I don't feel they came across in the way that I would have liked them to. Some, including the actual 911 call placed by one of the victims, are disturbing, so listener discretion is advised. Thanks. At 12.53 a.m. on the morning of October 15, 2018, a frantic, garbled 911 call came in from the Kloss family residence at 126813 One Half Avenue, U.S. Highway 8, west of the city of Barron, Wisconsin. They're screaming throughout the 45 seconds of the call from what seems to be two different females. You'll hear that little is decipherable in the harrowing audio of the frantic 911 call other than the Barron County dispatcher trying to get information from the caller. The screaming voices are muffled and confused. The call goes to silence after what sounds very much like the racking of a shotgun, followed by another click that sounds suspiciously like a misfire. Here's the call. Where's your husband? Hello? 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 Hello?
Police arrived within minutes after the call was placed. Inside the home were the bodies of James and Denise Kloss. They'd both been shot to death. It was soon discovered that the Kloss couple's 13-year-old daughter, Jamie Lynn, was missing. This is Dark Poutine, episode 253, Away, Girl Gone, The Kloss Family Tragedy. It was only four minutes after the call disconnected that Barron County Sheriff's deputies arrived at the small bungalow. The residence was quiet as they approached cautiously. Shortly after the three responding officers arrived, Deputy James Presley commented on the 911 call he had just reviewed to fellow deputies, Eric Sedani and John Fick. He said, The tapes did not sound good. The Barron County deputies checked the perimeter for other exits from the residence. Finding none, they approached the front door. The condensation from the outer storm door prevented a clear view inside, but the inner wooden front door appeared to be open. Officers called out as they entered, with their guns drawn. Just inside in the hallway lay the body of a shirtless male, James Kloss. There was no doubt that he was deceased. His head and upper torso showed the type of trauma that the officer's training told them was a close-range shotgun blast. Brain matter, blood, bone, and other pieces of his flesh covered the wall near the dead man's body. A spent shotgun shell was laying near the 56-year-old man's corpse. What follows is a piece of real-time audio taken from the body cam recording of Barron County Sheriff's Deputy Eric Sedani. Let's have a listen. Open door. Somebody's down. Somebody's down. Sheriff's office! Sheriff's office! Suicide. Sheriff's office! You don't know that. There were several voices. Sheriff's office! Who's inside? Watch our asses, John. I got your Get on the radio. Let them know. Have burn for you. 329 Baron. Possible suicide if you want to let Baron PD swing out here as well. Okay, want me to run these 28s? Eric, you want him to cover this door? Have EMS stayed. Okay. 329 Baron, if you could have EMS stayed. I'm gonna hold this for Baron PD. See that broken glass right there? That's your elbow. And the shotgun shell. Well, your shotgun. Go grab a long gun. Okay. Of note, on seeing the body of James Kloss, you can hear Deputy Sedani commenting suicide, to which Deputy Presley replied, you don't know that there were several voices. And Presley said later, I don't see a gun, guys. Let's not write this off as suicide. Yeah, I was thinking that was pretty quick of a jump to a conclusion by Sedani. Yeah. But at the same time, it's interesting listening to police talk like in real time like that. Yeah. I imagine these poor police officers actually probably see a lot of suicides, probably more than murders. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. And... God, that's a tough job, man. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like, like he's probably seen suicides many times before yeah. than, than a murder, so I don't blame him at all. But, um, yeah, can you imagine this is your job? You're walking into these things. The badly splintered wooden door in its frame indicated that someone had forced their way in, possibly with a kick. There were other signs of a violent struggle. There was debris strewn about in the front door area, and a chair by the kitchen table was overturned and broken. The deputies discovered another shotgun shell and a phone in a hallway in front of the open bathroom door. That door was damaged and appeared to have been kicked open as well, 
Inside the bathroom, Deputy Fick was horrified to discover another gruesome scene. Slumped against the wall and sitting in the bathtub was a deceased red-haired woman, Denise Kloss, James Kloss's 46-year-old wife. She was dressed in a gray hoodie, black leggings, and socks. Blood and bone matter were all over the wall behind her lifeless body. She, too, had suffered a close-range shotgun blast to the head. A large portion of the back of her head and skull lay next to her in the tub. A spent shotgun shell was on the lawn beside the front stairs. Closer inspection of the front door showed powder burns and a hole indicating someone had shot through the door, which suggested the use of slugs other than shot. Autopsies on Mr. and Mrs. Kloss later confirmed this was the type of ammunition used. Slugs are massive, large-caliber projectiles that inflict catastrophic damage on their target. As the fatal rounds were to the head in both victims' cases, the perpetrator intended to kill and leave no witnesses. Thankfully, death would have been instantaneous, and Mr. and Mrs. Kloss did not suffer. But, I mean, that's one blessing. Yeah. Are, are slugs the ones that expand when they connect? Well, no, not necessarily. Okay. There are slugs that will, but okay. it a slug... You know, a shotgun usually has a bunch of all the pellets. Pellets. Yeah, I've shot a them. A slug yeah. is a single. Okay. A big, sing- big projectile. Right. Yeah. yeah. While clearing the house, deputies noted a bedroom decorated as though it belonged to a female, possibly a teen or tween. The room, the police learned, was James and Denise Kloss's thirteen-year-old daughter, Jamie's. Investigators checked under beds, in closets, the attic, or any other place she might be hiding, but she was not there. The house was empty save for the two corpses of Jamie's mom and dad. Police collected a cell phone belonging to Jamie from the counter in the darkened kitchen. For a teen to leave home without her phone was another red flag. It is unusual for anyone, especially a teen, to leave home without their phone. Yeah, I mean, how lost do you feel when you have gone out without your phone? I am always patting my pockets as I'm leaving the house to make sure that I have everything. And my phone is usually one of the main things that I I feel need. bad that I have this connection. Like, sometimes I go out intentionally without it. Mm-hmm. But then I'm like, what if something happens? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I went through the 70s and 80s and 90s without a phone. But yeah, Jamie, a teenager, Yeah, you know, if she had forgot, she'd be back in 10 seconds. Exactly. Right? Yeah, that's a bad sign for a teenager's phone to be um, left there. Yeah. Officers surmised that Jamie was the real target of the attack and had been abducted by whoever had killed her parents. The shooter, the murder weapon, and Jamie were gone into the cold Wisconsin night. Police feared for her safety. Speaking with other investigators, Deputy Fick remembered seeing a single maroon-colored car with gray or silver trim, possibly a Ford Taurus, headed in the other direction as he and the other deputies responded to the Kloss residence. The car had pulled over and yielded as he flew by. Fick said that he did not see a license plate on the front of the car as he had passed, only a black frame where it should have been. It was a lead, albeit a thin one. Detectives gathered items from the home that they believed would provide samples of Jamie's DNA in the hope of later identifying her if required. As is the practice in suspected child abduction cases, local authorities called the FBI to assist. An amber alert went out with Jamie Kloss's particulars. She was five feet tall, weighing 100 pounds, with green eyes and long strawberry blonde hair. Three days after the murders and Jamie's abduction, The obituary for James and Denise Kloss was posted online. It reads in part, James and Denise Kloss, ages 56 and 46 of Barron, passed away Monday, October 15, 2018, at their home. James was born on September 25, 1962, in Lady Smith, Wisconsin, to James and Lynn Kloss. Denise was born on July 21, 1972, in Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, to Robert and Rebecca Nayberg. James and Denise were married on June 9, 2003 in Las Vegas, Nevada. They had worked at a Jenny O Turkey Store in Barron for 27 years. James loved the Green Bay Packers and the Wisconsin Badgers and getting into conversations on the glory days of his high school sports career. Denise loved working with her flowers, feeding her birds. She loved angels and helping everyone in any way she could. She was a member of St. Peter's Catholic Church in Cameron. End quote. 
Funeral services for James and Denise were held on Saturday, October 27, 2018 at 1 p.m. at St. Peter's Catholic Church in Cameron, with Father Balaraju Palasetti officiating. A private family burial was held at a later date. As the case grabbed national headlines, the rumors flew across all the social media platforms. Armchair detectives cruelly speculated Jamie was somehow involved in her parents' murder. Authorities denied that assumption. They stated that Jamie was not a suspect at all, she was a victim, and if she were alive at all, they believed she was in grave danger. Yeah, you know, I totally avoid any assumption about cases when I'm on social, if something's active. Yeah. Uh, it's like calling a game before the final whistle blows. You don't know how it's going to play out. No. And unlike a sports game, you know, these are people's lives and reputations. Yeah, there's a case right now here in the Lower Mainland in which a woman who I used to work with, Trina Hunt, uh, was murdered two years ago mm -hmm. today, actually, from this okay. recording. And interestingly, the only person arrested in question was her husband. That's usually the case. That's usually the case. However, he hasn't been charged with anything. Right. So a lot of people assume that yeah. he did something to her. But the facts aren't there yet. Right? No, the they're facts not. aren't there. Nobody knows. If, yeah, and you know, you're not you're, you're not actually seeing any evidence yourself. You're just online. Right? Yeah, and he did put the house up for sale today as well, which is interesting. Well, I, well, it's been two years, and I'd probably, if my husband was killed, mm -hmm. probably wouldn't want to stay in the same house. See, that's what's interesting. People are going to speculate one way or the other about it. Yeah. Anyway. Growing groups of volunteers searched for Jamie Kloss over the next few days. A week after she had disappeared, 2,000 people, two-thirds of the population in tiny Barron County, showed up searching for the missing middle school student who loved to dance and ran cross-country. Locals held a rally for Jamie Kloss titled A Gathering of Hope on one evening at the Barron High School football stadium. FBI put up a $25,000 reward for information leading to Jamie's safe return on October 24, 2018. Three days later, Jamie's parents, Denise and James, were laid to rest. Mourners packed the funeral venue. Scores of family, friends, and community members wanted to remember the much-loved Claus couple. They also prayed for Jamie's safe return and the capture of whoever had done these awful things to this innocent family. The FBI and police were there too, watching for anyone who stood out, but no one did. Reward money f to help catch a murderer. I, I get it. Yeah. But I think, well, I know that if, if I knew something to help capture a murderer, mm -hmm. there's no way I'd actually take money for it. Yeah. I just wouldn't. Or if I did, I'd give it to the victim's family. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I get it, but I would just, I could never do that. Yeah, I know who did it. Give me the money. Yeah. Like, like, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't understand. Yeah. It's, it's weird. Like, we see reward money often, but when you stop and think about it, right? When you stop and think, okay, I'm going to get the money because I know something, so therefore I'm going to go forward to, to take this money. Yeah. On the day of the Claus couple's funeral, in a weird series of events... A man was arrested after breaking in and tripping motion detectors in the Kloss residence that police had since locked down as a crime scene. A canine unit apprehended the man. He was Kyle Janke Annis, 32, of nearby Cameron, Wisconsin, who said he had recently started a job as a packaging operator at a nearby Saputo plant. When the officers searched him, they found that Kyle had personal items belonging to Jamie Kloss some of her underwear, a pink tank top, and one of Jamie's dresses. Janky Annis rambled throughout his interview with police, bouncing from one idea to another, his thought processes disjointed and scattered. It was difficult to determine his motivations for the break-in. Kyle indicated he was trying to help investigators by being in the house. He also spoke of violent fantasies involving revenge amid rants about child molesters. Kyle said he knew he would get caught, but he wanted to see who was looking for Jamie. The break-in was not the first time Kyle had been to the Kloss residence since hearing about the crime via social media. He admitted he'd been there on Monday morning as well. Kyle had walked over to watch the investigators moving in and out of the house, gathering evidence. Kyle Janky Annis was charged with felony burglary and held just in case so the cops could determine if he knew anything about the crimes. 
Kyle did not appear to have any information about the crime itself, although he claimed he wanted to help to find Jamie. Investigators determined Janky Annis was not the perpetrator of the murders or Jamie's kidnapping. He had wasted precious resources and investigators' time. This guy's a janky anus. <laughs> he is definitely a like, janky what, anus. What a dick. Yeah. It's like he wants to be involved somehow. It's like, I don't know. People see this kind of thing and think, now's my chance. Get out of the way. Yeah. Get yeah. out of the way, right? Yeah. Janky anus. Over the next month, the searches for Jamie wound down. There was no sign of her. Police followed up on numerous leads and questioned many known sex offenders from the area without any breaks or solid tips. On November 15, 2018, the Barron County Sheriff's Department posted an update on its Facebook page. It reads, This case remains the number one priority in Barron County and across the nation. We continue to follow up on leads, expand and view our recovered video from the area, and explore all digital evidence. We continue to partner daily with the FBI and DCI agents on the ground and across the country. As hunting season opens on Saturday, we ask that hunters report anything suspicious such as clothing, weapons, or anything you think is just not right on your property. Also remind everyone to have a safe hunt and good luck to all the hunters. While 30 days has passed, there is still hope in this department on this case, and the community support and prayers that we have been given continues to fuel our drive and determination to bring Jamie home. Thank you all for your support and prayers. And again, there's a tip out there that will solve this case and bring Jamie home. The release was signed Sheriff Fitzgerald. The reward for Jamie's return was now at $50,000. The FBI Milwaukee Twitter account posted an update on November 28, 2018. It said, The Jamie Kloss Tree of Hope on display in the lobby of Barron County Justice Center, reminds the public, we still need your tips to help find Jamie. Please call, and it gave a number. Our thoughts are with Jamie's family and friends this holiday season. The Twitter post also included a photo of Jamie Kloss smiling and another picture of the FBI Justice Center's Christmas tree. And we'll be back after a quick break. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo Concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. If you're looking for a smoking gun, I can absolutely guarantee you, you will not find it. In October 2001, a series of letters filled with a deadly powder called anthrax were dropped into the U.S. mail system. What started as an unprecedented case turned into an unsettling mystery. Who sent these deadly letters and why? From Campside Media and Sony Music Entertainment, I'm Josh Dean, and this is Cover Up Season 4, The Anthrax Threat. Available now. And we are back. Matthew, any thoughts on this one so far? The brutality in this is breathtaking. Yeah. I mean, I don't understand. You know, we've done a lot of shows together, right? Yeah. And, and covered a lot of bad cases. Mm -hmm. Even after all this time, I don't understand how a human can do something like this to other humans. Well. All the technical reasons, I yeah. know, like like mental stuff, blah, 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 whatever. But it's just actually carrying out. It's in my kind. soul. Like my soul can't understand it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yep. On the afternoon of January 10th, 2019 at 410 PM in Gordon, Wisconsin, Jean Nutter, a former social worker, took her dog for a walk. A distraught teenage girl approached her. The terrified girl was inappropriately dressed for the weather, wearing only leggings, a light t-shirt and dirty men's shoes that appeared to be on the wrong feet. The girl said, You've got to help me. Where am I? The girl went on to identify herself, saying she was Jamie Kloss. She'd been missing for 88 days, gone without a trace, but now here she was. Disheveled, dazed, and gaunt looking, but very much alive. Jamie was terrified, pointing back to the house that she'd come from, 
only two doors down from Jean's cabin, and talking a mile a minute. Jamie told Jean that she had been kidnapped and held there by a 22-year-old stranger named Jake Thomas Patterson. Jamie said, He came into our house. He shot my dad. My mom called 911. He shot my mom. He took me. I didn't know him. Jean reassured Jamie and made for the nearest house. Peter Kazinskis was cleaning fish when he was startled by pounding on the kitchen door. In rushed his neighbor Jean with her dog and a young girl. Jean exclaimed, It's Jamie Kloss, call 911. Kristen Kazinskis recognized Jamie right away and dialed 911. Here's some edited audio highlights from the beginning of the 40-minute call. Douglas County 911. Hi, I have um, a young lady at my house right now, and she just says her name is Jamie Kloss. Okay, what's your address? It's in Gordon, Wisconsin. Okay, have you seen her photo, ma'am? Yes, it Does, is her. I 100% think it is her. Right, okay. 100%. Does it look like she's going to run? No. She's sitting down. She's relaxing. Okay, hang on just a second. What's your name? Yep. What's your name, ma'am? Kristen Kaczynskis. Okay, did she show up walking? Yeah, a neighbor just walked up with her to our house and asked us to call 911. Okay, hang on just a second. Douglas, 922-929. Uh, Can you respond to 14102 S's and Sam Eau Claire Acre Circle? I have a Kristen Kafinskaff stating a female possibly missing person from Barron. She said it does look like her in regards to the photos. So I'm listening to that audio. What Talk about the right person to be the one to be calling 911 and to be taking care. Yeah, she's like, do you want a glass of water? Yeah, it's like she's she's joking around with her. Yeah, and trying keeping to keep it, her. Keeping it light. You and, can hear in her voice like, oh my God, right? Yeah. But, but then she's talking to her, trying to keep it light and just keeping her there. Mm -hmm. Interesting that the officer asked her if she seemed like she's going to run. Yeah, well, they don't know at that point what has happened. Yeah. So that all comes out later. Yeah, yeah. But it's really, really fascinating to to hear. And uh, yeah, you could hear in Kristen Kaczynska's voice how her uh, level of adrenaline was up yeah, and all I mean, that kind of I'm, stuff. Imagine, you know, there's some missing persons case and mm -hmm. all of a sudden they're at your doorstep and you've been watching the news, right? And she sounded... This was, this was huge news at the time. Yeah, it was yeah. huge. And yeah. she sounded kind of happy too, which is like, I would be too, if you think about it. This kid is safe. It's, she's safe. Yeah. yeah. Oh, thank goodness she's safe. Yeah. Based on the information given by Jamie through Kristen, police vehicles made their way to the residence at 14102 South Eau Claire Acres Circle. Other deputies went to look for Jake Patterson and his vehicle. Jamie identified herself again to the first officers to arrive. Since the killer was still on the loose, they whisked the shaken but grateful teen into a police cruiser's front seat and drove her out of the area to safety. The officer driving Jamie noticed a red car matching Jake Patterson's vehicle's description headed in the other direction on Eau Claire Acres Circle. The officer alerted the sighting to other officers in the area. Douglas County Sheriff's Deputy DeRosia received the call about the red car coming his way and when it passed, the officer noticed there was a single male occupant. DeRosia ran the plates and they came back as belonging to 14166 South Eau Claire Acres Circle, the house where Jamie claimed she had been held. The deputy pulled out and followed the car as it went past the driveway of its registered address. Other police cruisers quickly joined. Rather than follow too much further and risk a dangerous chase, DeRosia turned on his flashing lights and pulled the car over. The officers drew their sidearms and cautiously approached the vehicle. They asked the man inside if his name was Jake Patterson. He said it was. The deputies ordered Jake to step out of the car with his hands raised. As Jake got out of the car, hands in the air, he stated he knew why he had been stopped and said, I did it. Jake Thomas Patterson, a 21-year-old laborer 
calmly allowed himself to be cuffed and put into a squad car. When he was under arrest, he asked, for what? Even though he'd just admitted that I did it. The officer holding Jake told him that he would get the details when they were back at police headquarters. The wheels were set in motion to acquire the proper warrants to search Jake's car and his residence for evidence related to the crimes. Upon hearing of Jake's apprehension over the cruiser's radio, Jamie smiled. Her physical trauma was coming to an end, but she would still have to undergo the invasive medical exams typical after suspected sexual assault. Jamie was taken to the Gordon Fire Hall for an initial medical evaluation by female firefighters before going to the hospital for a more detailed examination. Under interrogation, Jake Patterson spoke at length to police interviewers about what he had done. His obsession with abducting a girl started sometime in 2015. He'd been fantasizing about it since then. One day on his way to work, Jake happened to see Jamie Kloss getting onto the school bus and became interested in her. He later watched her walk home and began to formulate his plan. In the weeks leading up to the murder and kidnapping, Jake had made two visits to the Kloss home with the intent to abduct Jamie, but had chickened out. Although he hadn't followed through, both attempts were valuable dry runs in his opinion. Jake became more familiar with the property each time, and he knew he would work up the courage eventually. After stealing license plates from another vehicle and affixing them to his car in the wee hours of October 15, 2018, Jake was ready to make his move. He took great pains to ensure he would not leave any evidence at the scene. Jake shaved his head and his beard. He vigorously cleaned his Mossberg 500 shotgun with a cloth to remove his fingerprints and loaded it with six slugs he had also wiped down individually. After a shower, Jake put on jeans, a black pullover with gloves, and a black balaclava to hide his identity. He put heavy brown steel-toed boots on his feet before leaving home to go to the Kloss residence. Jake pulled into the Kloss's driveway, and as he approached the home, he saw James Kloss through the window of the darkened residence. Jake pointed the shotgun at James and yelled for him to get on the ground, but Jake wasn't sure the man heard him because he didn't react. Jake went up to the door and began pounding, demanding entry. He called out, open the fucking door. When Jake saw James Kloss looking through the small window in the front door, he put the gun against the glass and coldly shot the man through the window. Jake tried to kick the door open but was unsuccessful, so he shot off the lock. He shoved James Kloss's body out of the way, stepping over it as he entered the home. Using a flashlight to find his way around, he saw every door in the small bungalow was closed. Jake could see a light shining under one of the doors in the hallway. He made his way there and heard sounds and a pair of panicked female voices coming from inside. The door was locked. He yelled for the women inside to open up, but his commands were met with only screams. Frustrated, Jake decided he couldn't wait anymore. He obliterated the flimsy door with a few kicks and then finally used his shoulder to pop it open. Inside, he found his target, Jamie, and her mom, Denise, huddled together inside the family's bathroom. Denise told Jake that she had called 911 and showed him the phone. Jake ripped the phone out of her hand and threw it into the hallway. Jake produced a roll of duct tape and told Denise to put it over Jamie's mouth, but Denise refused, so he had to do it himself. After Jamie was secured, Jake coldly put the gun to Denise's head and pulled the trigger, ending her life. Jake claimed he looked away as he executed the innocent woman. Oh, thanks for looking away, Jake. Right. This is her mom in yep. front of her. Like, how can this guy be so uncaring about the sanctity of human life? For him, it's a means to an end, you know? Like, he doesn't care. He's selfish. My selfish motivation, I'm going to, like, kill two other human beings. Yep. And then, and then kidnap a kid. Yep. Jake dragged Jamie outside and forced her into the trunk of his car. Not wanting to draw attention to himself... Jake then calmly drove the speed limit nearly 80 miles back to his residence outside Gordon, Wisconsin. Along with other evidence from the crime, Jake later burned Jamie's clothes in his fireplace. Afterwards, he went to Walmart and bought Jamie more clothing. He put the shotgun into another car's trunk in his driveway where police later found it. Jake said he forced Jamie to sleep in his tiny twin bed with him at night. He admitted to having sexual fantasies about the teenager, but said he felt too guilty to have sex with her. Jake and Jamie would talk and play board games late into the night. 
When he was not around or others were in the house, which was a rare occurrence, Jake would force Jamie under his bed and warn her to be quiet. Jake would then put bins and laundry baskets full of free weights and dumbbells around the bed to prevent her from leaving. It was not a secure prison, but Jake knew she was afraid of him and would not try to escape, or at least he thought. She was afraid, but escape she did. And Jamie told her story too. Jake would leave Jamie there alone in the dark under his bed sometimes for as many as 12 hours while he went out for one reason or another, primarily to work. During these extended periods of solitary confinement, Jake would provide Jamie with adult diapers to urinate and defecate in, and often little to no food or water. One time, Jake noticed Jamie had moved the bins a bit. He became livid and struck her on the back with a tool he used to clean the blinds. Terrified, Jamie would lay there, going over and over the brutal murder of her parents in her mind. She knew death was a real possibility for her. What would happen if Jake became bored of her? Jamie knew she had to get away before that happened. After being alone for six hours on the day of her escape, Jamie decided she had to take a chance and flee. She pushed and kicked the hampers full of weights out of the way and climbed from under the bed. Having no shoes of her own, Jamie put on a pair of Jake's and ran out into the cold. Thirteen-year-old Jamie had saved her own life. Wanting to avoid trial, 21-year-old Jake Patterson pleaded guilty to two intentional homicide counts and one count of kidnapping. Jake was emotional and his voice shook as he spoke to the judge, admitting what he'd done. At Jake's sentencing, a statement from Jamie who'd been in the courtroom was read by family attorney Chris Gramstrup. Jamie's statement said in part, quote, Last October, Jake Patterson took a lot of things that I loved away from me. It makes me the most sad that he took away my mom and my dad. I loved my mom and dad very much and they loved me very much. They did all they could to make me happy and protect me. He took them away from me forever. Jamie continued, Jake Patterson can never take away my courage. He thought he could control me, but he couldn't. I feel like what he did is what a coward would do. I was brave. He was not. He can never take away my spirit. He thought that he could make me like him, but he was wrong. He can't ever change me or take away who I am. He can't stop me from being happy and moving forward with my life. I will go on to do great things in my life, and he will not. Jake Patterson will never have any power over me. I feel like I have some power over him because I get to tell the judge what I think should happen to him. He stole my parents from me. He stole almost everything I love from me. For 88 days, he tried to steal me, and he didn't care who he hurt or who he killed to do that. He should stay locked up forever. I love this statement from her. Yeah, me it's too. It's powerful. It's truthful. I think maybe in some ways it's, um, because, you know, this is going to scar you for a little bit, right? A little bit. Right? So I think in a way it's... Yeah. I kind of also read that as a as a statement of intent from her. Yeah. Right? Because she's still coming out of all of this trauma. And to me, it's a strong statement of intent. This is how I'm going to live my life. He's not going to have taken this stuff away from me. Right. Right? Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, her the encouragement for her to write this didn't come with some help from a professional as well. Like, I'm not saying a professional wrote it. No. What I'm saying is probably... There were people there to help her to maybe to get to that. Maybe because yeah. it, it kind of reads like, "Hey, this is your. It's not. This is your your statement of intent for your future." Yeah. Right. Yeah. The judge threw the book at Patterson, sentencing him to two consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole or release for the murders. The judge then gave Jake the maximum sentence of twenty five years for Jamie's kidnapping, also to be served consecutively. Jamie Kloss is living with family and is doing well as can be expected considering the nightmare she endured. The prisoner's code does not look kindly on men who hurt children. Jake Patterson has been no exception. Jake got into a fight with another inmate. The other prisoner was upset to have a Skinner, jail slang for a pedophile, in his prison section. Prison officials put Patterson into protective custody after that. This was one of the most shocking and closely followed cases in the past five years. I'm so grateful that it comes with a relatively happy ending compared to the tragic and violent way that it began. That is, Jamie Kloss survived her ordeal, 
but sadly without her mom and dad. I'm sure she's still on the road to recovery and will be for a very long time. And Jake Patterson is right where he belongs, rotting behind bars. What a crazy episode. It was. Yeah, that, I mean, it's the first story in my book for a reason, because uh, I was just so moved by it, especially the fact that she survived this ordeal. Yeah. You know? Um, that doesn't happen often. No. Especially it, after 88 days. 88 days and two murders. Yeah. So this guy was willing to do anything. So yeah. she was very, very <laughs> she's blessed. A, to she's lucky she escaped, to, right? Yeah. Well, she... Brave, not lucky, she bravely escaped. Bravely escaped, yeah. Um, because once he got bored, you know, you know where he, what he would have done. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. It's time for voicemails. You can leave us a message at one 327 5786 or 1-877-DARK-PTN. We'd love to hear from you. Let's see who called us this week. All righty. Let's listen to our first voicemail. The person left. Hi, Mike and Matthew. Um, I, I've been a long time listener. Um, you guys do such a great job together on this podcast. So thanks for taking me through my long and tedious works, uh, work, work weeks uh, for the past few years. Um, my name is Carrie, and I am a, born, a Chinese-born Canadian out of Victoria, and I still live here to this day. Uh, a couple of years ago, my family and I were camping with another family, and we began talking about each other's family history. Mine included my grandfather having to pay a head tax, and the other people didn't know what that was, so I had to explain that to them. I don't know if you've ever dived into the history of Chinese immigrants and how they were also involved with building railroads, but would love to hear an episode of it. Um, I just thought it would be interesting as it is a part of Canadian history. It's almost Chinese New Year's here, so I um, just want to say Gong Hei Fat Choi, Sun Nien Fai Lok, and I'll sign off with Oh Tok Si Hai Mei Deng Mo La. Thanks, bye. I think she just told us to go shit in our hats in Chinese. I know she told Mandarin. us. She said, "Yeah, she said Happy New Year." That's great. Yeah, and and yeah, Carrie. So. Did she say she's from Victoria. Yes, yeah, she did. Yeah, I would love to do, um, something on Chinese immigration in Canada. Yeah, I. It's on my list to do. What she's talking about is actually on the list to do. And I, I was thinking actually because she mentioned the two things together. Chinese building the railroad mm -hmm. and also the head tax. I was thinking that those, that would be one good episode. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, there's this, um, cartoon book. What do you call them? Um, a comic? Comic kind of thing, but a it's graphic novel. Graphic novel. Yes. I call the, I call them my illustrated picture books. Okay. <laughs> I called the, the good Asian Okay. And it's it's about uh an an Asian um cop agent in San Francisco uh years ago in America, but there's a bit of the history of early immigration. Sure, yeah. And and they have they have like a uh at, at the back of the book they actually tell the history and the hardships yep. at the time. And I'm like, I just learned something from a comic book. Yeah. Right? But um Fascinating. Definitely dark part of Canada's history as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we'll do that. We will. Promise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's another voicemail. Looks like this one's from the 902 area. So uh, that's my neck of the woods, Nova Scotia PEI. Hi, guys. Um, it's Lobster Poutine Girl calling again. It's been mm, probably over six months since the last time I called. Anyways, I've just listening to your latest video, or video, honestly, sorry, uh, your latest episode um, on the, the sinking of there, the very BC, and it's really interesting. I kind of uh, have an, fast, not fascination, but an interest in sinking and shipwreck history, because being from Nova Scotia, well, we're, our coast was littered with that history. But I just had a story idea, um, 
if you guys do quick Google the city of Monticello, it was a um, a side wheeler ship that um, shipwrecked off the coast of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. I think it was in 1900. And anyways, the reason why um, there's a lot of documentation, a lot of local history documentation, but you can find newspaper articles and stuff online about it. But it was a little sad because my hometown, um, half the crew was from my hometown, um, like in the Barrington area down in Nova Scotia, about an, about an hour south of Yarmouth. Anyways, so it was it was quite the tragedy at the time. Um, and then there was a story about a stained glass window that was commissioned and different stuff. Anyways, it's, it's a really interesting story and fascinating story. I just learned about it recently, actually. Um, never knew about it. And uh, I just thought it might make a cool episode idea. Because um, I, I thought you guys just you do such a good job covering um, the dark side of Canadian history. So, anyways, thanks for everything you guys do. I'm not going to tell you to go take a shit in your hat, because I think you guys are great. Anyways, thanks for making my morning commute more bearable. Have a good week. Bye. Yay. Well, then my shout out for you uh, early this episode was, was for your commute. Yeah. And I love that you used the word video. And I just looked at Mike and I thought he does not have the face for video. I don't. <laughs> hey. <laughs> anyway. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and her accent. the uh, That accent made me so homesick. Did it? Oh, my gosh. It's beautiful. I, yeah. I, like, it's, well, it's the South Shore. Like, that's where it. I'm. that's where I'm from. It's great. I love yeah. it. Yeah. It, Did you lose your accent when you moved over here? I, I didn't really have much of an accent to begin with, but I worked, when I was taking acting classes, that was part of what we did, was to work on elocution and to right to lose the accent that you have. Okay. So you sound a little more... Uh, Inter, not international, but... Um, yeah, so it's, so so everyone's ear accepts it, sort of thing, because yeah. you're doing a show, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's no, it's a, it's a wonderful accent. I think I prefer the act that actors that are trained with the Mid Atlantic accent, so it sounds kind of American Canadian and kind of British as well. <laughs> I love that sound, but I don't have that, obviously. I kind of ended up with one after decades in London. Yeah. But it just went away. Of after, course. After yeah. I was here for six months and the big old Canadian accent just came back. Your husband's got a very British accent. Kind of posh, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is. He totally is. <laughs> That's it for this week's voicemails. Again, you can leave us one at one 327 5786 or one 877 We'd love to hear from you, even if it is just to say hi and to tell us to go shit in our hats. If you're stumped for what to chat with us about, a quick story is welcome. Uh, it's time for Donut Money Donors and Patreon patrons shout outs. And uh, first up, Carrie. Carrie, who we just heard from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Carrie Chow. Uh, yeah. We know she's from Victoria. Yeah, exactly. I think Carrie, she didn't say what she does. I think she's a color expert. A color expert. Yeah, so she col combines color psychology, current trends, demographics, color design theories, and she's one of these people that sort of decides next year's color. Oh, there you go. Yeah. That's kind of fun. Yeah. That's what she does. Like, uh, yeah. Yep. I, I don't, I wish I had a job like that. That would be a fun job. I'd like to decide some stuff. <laughs> you I want, I wanted to be a futurist when I was young. For oh, that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Just like what's going to happen. But Carrie does that, but... In the realm of color. Very nice. Yep. Next up, we have Dan. Just Dan. Dan just... from Bhutan. He's from Bhutan. Well, I don't know if he's from Bhutan. Uh, yeah, he is. Oh, you, you're saying he's from Bhutan. Yes, Dan from Bhutan. Okay, and what does Dan do in Bhutan? He's a video game tester. Oh, he tests video games. Yes. Anything that you, I... You'd like that job. Yeah, anything that I've played, like World, World of War Warcraft. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah, you know, yeah. he made, he he like gave a lot of feedback on the flowers for the flower collecting. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm currently looking for saxifrage. Okay. And bubble poppies. Bubble poppies. And and hawk and bloom. Are there any black lotuses? Uh, not not anymore. Okay. There used to be. 
but yeah, it's been a long time. Black Lotus, lots of mana. Lots of mana, yeah. <laughs> oh, you played during Burning Crusade then. Yeah, and I'm, I'm fascinating, fascinated with the Black Lotus and the idea of the Lotus Eaters from um, from uh, Homer's uh, Odyssey. Oh, cool. Because they went on this one island and they eating the lotuses and it was making them forget everything. I got uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad as my uh, editor's extra from Audible for having an Audible account this this month. So I love the stories. Yeah, me too. So anyway. Thank you, Dan. And thank you, Carrie. Yes, thank you for being patrons. C hey, if, if Carrie, the color expert, maybe could work with Dan, the video game tester. Yeah. And she can she can make sure like... You know, contemporary colors are in video games. Could be. The screens yeah. are getting better. Justin yeah. and I got one of those OLED TVs. Yep. And we're watching sci-fi. We're watching, um, what's that show called? I don't know. The, it's like Star Trek, but way better. Orville. Oh, Orville. Orville. Oh, really? I well, haven't seen it. It's great. It's that with, uh, that's with Seth. Yeah. Yeah. It's really good. And there's. A family guy. The new, yeah. When I, but at first he's the captain of the ship and I was like, is that the dog from Family Guy? Yes, it <laughs> is. Because that's his voice, right? Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's a good show. And the, the new colors on TVs are fantastic. So they need people like Carrie to help people like Dan do colors on video games. There you go. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks to all our patrons and Donut Money donors past and present for your generosity. It helps to keep the show going. You can become a patron of Dark Poutine at patreon.com slash dark poutine. For a one-time donation, you can send us donut money via PayPal using our email address, darkpoutinepodcast at gmail.com. If you don't already subscribe to the show, it would mean a lot if you did. You can easily find Dark Poutine on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. If you haven't gotten yours yet, my book, Murder, Madness, and Mayhem, is available to order via a link on the Dark Poutine website. And speaking of darkpoutine.com, please check it out for show notes and other cool stuff. We'd appreciate it if you took the time to give Dark Poutine a like or a follow on Facebook and Instagram. Most importantly, thank you for listening. And tell your friends about us. Word of mouth is a powerful thing. And that is it for yet another episode of Dark Poutine. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye, everybody. Bye. Hi, it's Shauna, and I might be a bad parent because my kids think french fries are vegetables. Hey, it's Ryan, and I might be a bad parent because I went out for wings when my wife was in the hospital after giving birth. Johnny here. I might be a bad parent because in my house, the tooth fairy gives pocket change. But we're not alone. Len emailed us and said his six-year-old daughter's Tarzan moment going from love seat to lazy boy by curtains made him more proud than any dance <laughs> recital. <laughs> and Andy left his two-year-old at the rink. All right, guys, I'm sure we're not alone, like Andy's kid. <laughs> For stories and confessions like this, make sure you check out our podcast. It's called Bad Parents, and it's available wherever you get your podcasts. I left a glove at the rink.